The normal view is that the material world is real. We're localised in three-dimensional space, we're looking around, we can reconcile how we see the world. The trouble is that's wrong, because Einstein told us that actually reality is really four-dimensional. We don't notice it because you only notice it if you're moving at near the speed of light or in a strong gravitational field, and that's standard physics. What I'm saying is that actually reality is more than four-dimensional. There are higher dimensions, and these higher dimensions are to do with mind. It's mind with a capital M, as distinct from my individual mind with a capital little m. This has the important implication that the brain is a filter rather than a generator of consciousness. And that is a view which I imagine 90% of neuroscientists at least wouldn't accept. But I think there is evidence. I think there is evidence that for the filter theory. I don't know, but they constructed this three-dimensional space inside their five-dimensional reality. You've seen that time is represented here as a physical dimension. The physical world, the material world, is like a four-dimensional slice. It's called a brain. B-R-A-N-E, and it's in this higher dimensional bulk. That's just the term they use. And in what's called brain cosmology, which goes a bit beyond that, that says our, in, because cosmology is the large scale structure of the universe, this sheet, this brain actually moves through the bulk. If the world is really, say, five dimensional, as like the bulk, and we're only on a slice of this five dimensional space, what else is there in the rest of the space off the belt? Well, the only thing I'm aware of is my mental world, my, my dreams, my memories, my visualizations, my out-of-body experiences, my near-death experiences. So to me, it's very natural to try and say that these experiences can be described in terms of this higher dimensional space. I mean, there's ESP, where one mind is communicating with another mind. There is clairvoyance when the mind is perceiving what is in the physical world. There is precognition when the mind is perceiving what's in the future. But the key point about all these phenomena is that they are not explained by conventional physics. As a physicist, I want to know whether physics can be expanded to accommodate these phenomena. But you'll have physicists say, and sometimes my friends will say, Psi can't be real because it's incompatible with the laws of physics. I don't even need to look at the data because I know it can't be true. To me, that's a terrible attitude, but it's an attitude some people say. I don't need to look at the data because I know it can't be true. In other words, they refuse to look through the telescope. You're going back to Galileo where people wouldn't look through the telescope. We don't have a final theory of physics. We know quantum theory, which works so well in the microscopic domain, and relativity theory, which works in the macroscopic domain, they, they work beautifully in their own domains, but we know those theories are not compatible. The final theory of physics has to go beyond relativity and quantum theory. And we don't know what that final theory is. That's what everyone is looking for, the final theory of physics, which some people are looking for. We cannot possibly say that final theory of physics is not going to allow consciousness because we don't know what that theory of physics is. And my own view, and, and I'm echoing what Roger Penrose says here, my own view is that that final theory of physics will make some reference to consciousness and, and mind. Welcome to Essentia Foundation channel. Thank you for watching. Today we'll be talking to Professor Bernard Carr um, he's a professor of mathematics and astronomy with personal interest in parapsychology. And we'll be asking him the following questions. Can there be a theory that encompasses everything that happens in the universe? What is consciousness? What role can science play in the study of parapsychological phenomena? So Bernard, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to talk to us about these topics. And I wanted to start by asking you a bit more personal question. So for more than 50 years, you were involved in the activities of the Society for Psychical Research in the UK. And we should add here that this society was founded in 1882. Indeed. Yes. And its members included eminent scientists, Nobel Prize winners, even Britain Prime Minister, right? That's correct. Yes, Balfour. And you took various roles within the society as education officer and chairman of the research activities committee 
and later on he became president of the society. So my question is how and why, you as a scientist, did you become involved with parapsychology in the first place? It goes back to my school days. I was at a boarding school called Harrow and on one occasion I misbehaved and as a punishment I was confined to my room which meant that I wasn't allowed to go anywhere except for lessons. And having nothing else to do, I, I read some books. I read three books. And those three books really determined the course of my life. Now, the first book was called The ABC of Relativity, which was about relativity theory. By, it was written by Bertrand Russell. And that got me fascinated in, in physics. The second book was called An Experiment with Time by J.W. Dunn. And that, in that book, he recorded his various precognitive dreams and his theory to account for them. And that got me interested in psychical research because premonition is one of the phenomena studied by psychical research. The third book was, it was called The Third Eye by Lobsang Rampa. And he was allegedly a, a, a Tibetan Lama who'd taken over the body of a Cornish fisherman. Well, to be honest, that it probably wasn't true, but nevertheless, it was fascinating because he gave insights into in some of the ideas of, of Tibetan Buddhism and, and some of the psychic phenomena associated with that. And that got me interested in religious studies. So really, these three books, which I read in one week, they got me interested in, in science, in psychical research, and in, and in religion. And in some sense, psychical research, I see as a, a bridge between science and, and religion, between science and mystical experience, if you like, because it's trying to analyze phenomena in a scientific way, but it's also analyzing phenomena which are sometimes thought of as, as mystical. So that's how I got interested in psychical research, but as one of three areas. And throughout my life, I've always tried to relate those three areas. But as regards psychical research, I think it was shortly after that that I did my first experiment at school. And this was a boarding school. And the experiment was I, I had a group of people to record their dreams over a one week period. So I had about 100 boys recording their dreams. And the idea was simply to see whether they had shared dreams so that A dreamt of B and B dreamt of A in the same circumstances, or A dreamt of C and B dreamt of C. So the idea was to show that there was a link, a telepathic link, if you like, when people dream. So to, uh, to be honest, it, it wasn't such a good experiment because people could cheat, they could collude. But nevertheless, it was the first experiment I did. And I, I did, at the time, I reported that it got very significant results. I, I wouldn't be so confident today, but, but at the time I was very excited about it. Shortly after that, when I was still at school, I, I got interested in out-of-body out experiences. There was a, a famous book by, um, uh, on out-of-body experiences, and I started practicing that. And to be honest, I, uh, I, I did start having out-of-body experiences, but I found it rather frightening, so I, I, I stopped doing that for a while. Then I went to Cambridge University as an undergraduate, and I immediately joined three societies. I joined the Astronomical Society, the scientific side, the Society for Psychical Research, and the Buddhist Society. And then I started meditating and things like that. And really, ever since then, those have been my three areas of activity in life. But when I was undergraduate, when I was an undergraduate, I was actually spending more time on psychical research than I was on studying mathematics, although I was officially a mathematics student. And we did lots of experiments. One of the first experiments I did was to try and weigh the soul. There'd been reports that when people die, their weight goes down by a few ounces. Now, I, I think the evidence for that is not very good, but nevertheless, I, I read that. And because I was interested in out-of-body experiences, I was thinking, right, if it's true when I have a dream that I leave my soul leaves my body and it moves around, then that means that my body weight should go down by a few ounces when, I, when I'm dreaming. And then when I come back again, it will go up by a few ounces. So I did a simple experiment 
in Addenbrooke's hospital, in which I basically weighed people as, when they fell asleep to see if their weight went down when they fell asleep and went up again when they, when they woke up. And if that was the case, it would be evidence, if you like, for the soul or the astral body or whatever you want to call it. And it wasn't a really good experiment because, I mean, it, I, I made up this apparatus to weigh and, and it, it was a, made of Meccano and elastic bands. It wasn't a very good apparatus. But uh, you could do it in principle, but you'd have to spend £10,000 on a sophisticated weighing machine. And however, many of my friends remember me as the person who weighed their souls. And I did at the time claim to, to, to detect the effect, actually. Uh, again, in retrospect, I don't think it was such a good experiment because I don't think the, the technology was good enough for the weighing mechanism. And then through the society, the Cambridge University Society of Psychical Research, we did many experiments, and I, I won't describe them, it would take long, but these were all basically experiments to look for evidence of telepathy, for example, mind-to-mind -mind communication, and evidence for psychokinesis, mind over matter. But besides doing experiments, we would also go on regular uh, ghost hunts, for example. My, my, the president of the Cambridge Society was a friend of mine called Tony Cornell. He was like my mentor in psychical research and he became a good friend. And he, he was the leading ghost hunter in this country, but this country meaning England. And he, he's, he, he died some years ago, but he used to take us out to haunts and, and we would visit mediums and things like that. So the psychical research then involves both experimental studies, but also what we call spontaneous investigations, where we're studying psychical phenomena as they occur in, in real life. It might be a ghost or it might be visiting a medium who is giving you information apparently coming from someone who's died. So really that's, uh, after that, I, I then, in my professional career, there were no jobs in parapsychology, so in my professional career I became a a physicist, I became a cosmologist, and I did my PhD with Stephen Hawking, which of course got me off to a good start. He wasn't so famous in those days, but he was known to be a very brilliant physicist. And so that started my career as a cosmologist, and of course that's taken most of my time. But I've always continued my interest in psychical research, and indeed in spiritual experience. And as I said, I joined the Society for Psychical Research in, in 1972. 50, just over 50 years ago, and, and I've had various roles within the SBR, which you described in your introduction, and indeed I was very honoured to serve as president for a period, I think, 2000 to 2005. So that's a rather long answer to your question. I will only say in the last 50 years I have continued my, my interest in psychical research. But really, my main interest in the last 50 years has been to develop a theory of, of psi, but we may come on to that in a later question. Yeah, but so what I hear you're saying is that for you, psychical and scientific were intertwined, if not the same, the same interests, right? You, you can't really separate, in your case, interest in psychical research and in science as such, correct? For me, I, I had a... a personal interest in, in psychical research and science, so I naturally tried oh to God. link them. But the whole point about psychical research is that it does aspire to be a science, because when the society was founded in 1882, it was founded with the intention of studying in a scientific manner those phenomena which seem to involve anomalous cognition or influence on the world, which can't be explained in conventional terms. But it, the whole point was to use the methodology of science, and many of the founders and the eminent people in the early days were physicists even. And, and so that's important. On the other hand, you have to bear in mind that mainstream science is still very sceptical about psychical phenomena. Not many of my physics colleagues even believe in psi, that doesn't bother me, it's because they haven't studied the evidence. And most people who are interested in this phenomena are interested in it because they've had experience and they want to explain the experience. But not everyone has these experiences and, and, and so I understand why they're not interested in the phenomena. And so it doesn't bother me at all when my 
physics colleagues are sceptical. Well, no, it doesn't bother me when they're, they're not interested in the phenomena and they, they can't be bothered to read the evidence in the literature. I only get annoyed when people know nothing about it and still say it's nonsense. But what were the most interesting cases that you studied or you were involved in? Well, it, it depends what you mean by cases. I mean, I could talk about the experiments which have been done, but when one talks about cases, one is normally talking about what we call the spontaneous cases, which are like visiting mediums and, and, and haunted houses and things like that. There were quite a number of those. I suppose one of the most famous cases was what's called the Enfield poltergeist case. Now, probably in Holland people haven't heard of this, but this was a case in London, in, in Enfield, which was a poltergeist case involving, centering around a family, and in particular focused on a, on a, on a young girl. And this attracted enormous media attention, and it, and it was investigated by some colleagues of mine in, in the Society for Psychical Research. And it's a famous case, it just went on for so long, it went on for nearly a year. And it was recorded, I mean, the people were there filming and recording events very scrupulously, so we have very good records. And sometimes it's purported to be the best poltergeist case of the century. Having said that, some people were sceptical, some people thought it was the children playing around. But on the other hand, other people were convinced this was, this was really a poltergeist effect, because we know poltergeist effects tend to be associated with adolescence very often. And the idea is that the poltergeist case is, it represents the ability of psychokinesis, mind over matter, because physical phenomena occur. Objects move, lights go on and off, electricity anomalies, all sorts of things. But the point about poltergeist is a physical effect. And some people think that that is a physical effect generated by a human, an adolescent who's going through some t personal tensions or something. Other people think, though, the poltergeist involves spirits, because that's what it literally means, a, a, a noisy spirit. And in the Enfield case, there, there, there was some evidence that perhaps there was a spirit involved because someone who died in the house was coming through the children. But at the other, on the other hand, you might say it was just the psychokinetic effect of the children. And, uh, and a skeptic will just say it was the children playing around. But what's interesting about this case, I did actually visit on, on one evening and, and it's attracted a lot of attention. There have been two feature movies made about it. There's even a play on in London about the Enfield case. And just last month, a, a, a drama documentary came out on, on television about the Enfield case. And I found that particularly interesting because I only visited there one night, but they actually included my visit in the, in, the, in the reconstruction. And they have tape recordings of all the events and all the visitors there. So in this film, they, they have my voice as recorded at the time, though I'm played by an actor. So it was, uh, it was really quite fun to watch. But, but again, things happened on that evening that you came to visit? Him? Well, things apparently happened, but I wasn't quite, at the time, I wasn't so convinced. At the time, I wasn't convinced the children weren't playing around, but that was just one evening, and I wasn't an experienced poltergeist investigator. And I was there with Tony Cornell and, and Alan Gould, who's another famous uh, investigator of ghosts. And we weren't actually convinced at that time, but that was only one night. We weren't convinced it wasn't the children playing around, but later on, I rather changed my mind because there was so much data eventually, so many recordings that it was hard to believe that it was all down to fraud. So now, in retrospect, I think it really was a genuine poltergeist case, probably. You never know for sure, but probably. On the other hand, you have to be careful because some of these movies obviously are sensationalized for dramatic effect. So I've just isolated one case because that's the case which is actually quite topical at the moment. But what was happening in the house, actually? The well, that would take a long time no, to describe. I would just describe. give an example I mean, basically, of the most unusual Furniture activity. would move. Furniture move. Furniture would move. Um, the, the girl who was the focus would start being thrown out of bed and levitating. And, and that was recorded? Uh, girl it was, levitating? It was recorded. There are photographs of this. But of course, photographs can be manipulated. Of course, yes, for sure. These so, days so you can do anything <laughs> but, <laughs> on and, Mars if you want to. And, but uh, there were really countless physical mm. things. It would take too long to, to, yeah, yeah, to, to yeah. describe them all. But they were typical of a poltergeist case.
But it was just this poltergeist case went on for a long time mm -hmm. and, the, and the events were well recorded. So you got to the bottom of it actually in this case. So you, f you figured out what was the reason, the root cause of it. Well, it depends what you mean by exactly. got to the bottom of it. <laughs> we've, not, we've not got to the bottom of any psychic phenomena in the sense we don't have a, a, a clear theory for how it happens. Uh, if you mean we got to the bottom of it in the sense that we know it was real, even that might be ambiguous. I mean, I, I, personally, I think there was a genuine phenomenon going on, but it's still contentious. Even after 50 years, it was contentious at the time. Some, even some members of the Society of Psychical Research said, we don't believe this is a genuine case. Even now, 50 years later, we don't know for sure. If you ask me personally, I would say it was, it was genuine. Uh, least, but often at least you've got a mixture of, of, of genuine phenomena, maybe people helping the phenomena along. But I don't know for sure. But I mean, Tony Cornell, who was the world's one of the most famous ghost hunters in the world, he was very skeptical. He would always go to a case assuming it wasn't genuine, assuming there was some natural explanation. And I think that was even his impression of. of of Enfield. Nevertheless, he had investigated hundreds of cases and he came away convinced that some fraction of those cases were genuine. It might only be 20%, but some fraction of the cases were genuine. And, and he, that's why he spent his life studying the phenomena. So yes, I personally do believe some of these phenomena are genuine, but it's, there's always an element of uncertainty. And some of my friends, even friends who visited it, are skeptical. That's part of the fascination of the whole subject of, of psychical research, not just poltergeists, whether they're real phenomena or whether it's due to imagination or misinterpretation or even sometimes due to fraud. I've really been addressing the question of whether the phenomena are real. I mean, you asked me whether we've got to the bottom of science. So the first question to ask, are the phenomena real? Because there's no doubt that opinions differ about that. And, and again, you've got to say, well, what, what do you mean by psi? Because there are many different phenomena involved in psi. Generally, psi represents the mind. The word psi means for mind. So they're phenomena which involve the mind and consciousness, but they're various different types. I mean, there's ESP, where one mind is communicating with another mind. There is clairvoyance, when the mind is perceiving what is in the physical world. There is precognition, when the mind is perceiving what's in the future. Psychokinesis, when the mind is actually physically affecting the physical world. But the key point about all these phenomena is that they are not explained by conventional physics. They, they don't involve a conventional interaction as studied by the laws of physics. And, and that's why, of course, many physicists are skeptical about their existence, because they they know the laws of physics work well in one context and they don't want to think the laws of physics are being violated. So that's a very broad definition of, of psi. But the key point about it is that one, because it's a science, one is assuming these phenomena are natural. They're not supernatural. Sometimes we're saying it's su people portray these phenomena as being supernatural and that they can't be, ex be explained by normal laws of nature. But I at least start off with the assumption that they are natural, but they just involve a form of physical or a, a, a form of process which is not well understood yet, because science is always expanding and, and accommodating new phenomena. But in particular, as a physicist, I want to know whether physics can be expanded to accommodate these phenomena. So when you ask, have we got to the bottom of these phenomena, if by that you mean, have we got a theory of them, and in particular a theory of physics, I would have to say no. And that's one of the reasons why mainstream science remains skeptical of these phenomena, because we don't have a theory. Even if you've got the data, until you've got a theory, it doesn't really qualify as a proper scientific domain of science, because science requires a theory and it needs experiments to test the theory. Now, this doesn't mean there isn't a theory. I mean, I have my own theory. I, 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 what my passion has been, actually, ever since I was at school, my passion has always been to expand physics to accommodate mental and, indeed, spiritual phenomena. So I have my own approach, which we may talk about later. But I can't 
say across my heart, this is definitely the truth. It's my particular approach to how physics can be extended. But what I do, however it's going to happen, I do feel passionately that physics must expand to accommodate these phenomena, and in particular to accommodate consciousness. Because the key point about psychic phenomena, they involve mind, they involve consciousness, they, they involve a first person as opposed to a third person account of the world. So I think physics has to expand to accommodate that. Not all physicists would agree with me, and even if the physicists do agree, they might not agree with my particular theory, but that's what I feel rather passionately. So from your experience, what, what we can say is that the psi phenomena are not, are not all of them, are fiction. So they do exist and they are real. My and, personal view... And they are not fraught and yeah, they are not my, hallucinations my or any of them. My personal view is that at least some psi phenomena are real, but you've got to be aware of the fact the word psi is used in a very broad sense. Mm. And, and some people use, accommodate all sorts of other phenomena like uh, pyramid power and UFOs and, and all sorts of all sorts Everything of that ideas. we cannot explain, I Ex think. Exactly. <laughs> and then that's, that's part of the problem. People say psychical research is rubbish because they're thinking of a particular t topic which may well be rubbish. And the trouble is all psychical researchers have their own bubble threshold, so they will believe certain things and not other things. But if you put everything together under one heading, of course, you just say it's all nonsense. But that's, you have to discriminate. And I, I have a policy in life, even in physics, not just in psychical research, to never believe or disbelieve anything completely. So I won't say I'm 100% certain telepathy exists and I'm 0% and I'm 100% certain that pyramid power is, is wrong. I, I, I would never do that. I, but I have a, in my own mind, I have a sort of probability. So I will bet you 90% that telepathy is correct. I'll be, I might bet you 50% that psychokinesis is correct. If you ask me whether survival of consciousness after death, which is a, a problem, sometimes discussed by psychic research. I'm less certain about that. I tend to believe that, but I might only say 30%. So I think that's, that's really the true sceptical approach to these phenomena, is, to, is to, to keep your mind open and to, and to just try and get a balanced view. So the, the people who believe 100% or believe 0% or disbelieve 100% I think that's a very unhealthy attitude. I think you, you, you have to be open and, and you, somewhere in between. But but yet critical and sceptical. Critical scepticism, as opposed to the sceptics who are just completely closed-minded. Unfortunately, the word sceptic now is used in a, in a different sense. The word sceptic has been taken over by the people who are sometimes called counter-advocates. They think it's all nonsense. But So when you say someone's a sceptic, that says they don't believe any of the phenomena. The real word sceptic merely seems you're critical. You, you study the phenomena, but you don't make up your mind completely. You have a critical view. And in that sense, I'm a sceptic, and I think everyone should be a sceptic. But I do, nevertheless, believe some of these phenomena are real, and if I didn't, I wouldn't have spent 50 years studying them. And do we actually I understand that we don't have a theory explaining at least some of those, but do we have a better tools, scientific tools that allow us to study it now? Or are we still in the dark uh, and taking photographs or, or other better ways now that comparing? I mean, you, you're looking at this 50 years now down the road, right? Well, <laughs> where you started and where we are today. Do uh, we have better tools, better yes, methods? Yes, uh, 50 years from when I started, but remember the society started 140 were, years yeah. ago. Of course we have better tools, but it depends what sort of experiments and evidence you're talking about. When you're talking about ex experiments in the laboratory, we have much more sophisticated machines. We can look for different sorts of psychokinetic interactions effect on random number generators. We can look for more <clears throat> subtle forms of telepathy which might involve altered states of consciousness in meditation or mm -hmm. Gansfeld or different sort of state of mind which can be induced. So we can do experiments in a more sophisticated way. We can study the brain in a way we couldn't before. We can understand what is going on in the brain when people have these psychic or weird experiences, altered states of consciousness. 
when it, it comes to spontaneous events, such as uh, investigating a haunted house, again, we've got more sophisticated machinery. So now we have very sensitive cameras and devices which can measure sound and electromagnetic fields. And, and so the technology is vastly better now than it was 100 years ago, for example. On the other hand, you've got to be careful because better technology also increases the possibility for fraud, for people to play around. You can take, you can, you can take a photograph or a film and you can, you can create something which never happened by photoshopping and, and things like that. So the technology, it comes either, it's a, a Double-edged double sword. Double, a double-edged sword. It's a plus and a minus. But by and large, of course, it's not surprising that after 140 years, we have made huge advances, even though we haven't convinced all the sceptics, the counter-advocates, that Psy is real. We've, we have got far, far more evidence now. And in my own mind, the evidence for some of these phenomena like telepathy and clairvoyance, precognition, I think the evidence for that is, is, is pretty overwhelming. And it's partly because of the more sophisticated experiments uh, we, uh, and instrumentation. And also we have a better understanding of statistics, for example, because a lot of the evidence comes down to statistics and analysing, trying to determine what is an, ex an experiment, sorry, what is a, a mere coincidence and, and what requires an explanation. And the other thing I should say is that we somewhat expanded what we mean by psi, because when I was talking about psi, I was talking about telepathy and PK, but there are also experiences which you might describe as more mystical or spiritual than psychic. I mean, if you have an out-of-body experience, as I talked about that, as something got me interested in the subject, or if you have a near-death experience or a mystical experience, you might describe that as more mystical and psychic. So there's a semantic issue of what you, you include under the term psychic. Some parapsychologists, they don't like to talk about mystical experiences because they want to focus on experiments which, which have a psychological aspect rather than a spiritual aspect because some psychical researchers, I, I pointed out they form a bridge between science and spirituality in a way, but that makes you that's an uncomfortable position because the scientists think you're too spiritual and the spiritual people think you're too scientific. And so some people in parapsychology, they deliberately avoid getting too spiritual. The word spiritual is a taboo word because that's going to make them less credible to the scientists. However, I think now we're coming to the appreciation that you need a broader view of psychic phenomena which does incorporate the spiritual as well as the mere psychic. And you remember I started off saying I've got this interest in the three worlds, if you like, matter, mind and spirit. And I think you really need, whatever your final theory is going to be, even this extended theory of physics, to me it's got to relate to all those three worlds. I mean, we traditionally think of science as being associated with the material world, but the whole point of parapsychology is you're expending science to include the mental world. And that's not such a crazy idea now. I mean, because of developments in quantum theory and, and AI and cognitive science and things. And, and, but, but parapsychology itself, we now think there is an extended science which includes mind. But I think we also need to include the spiritual realms. But that's, that's much more controversial. There, there are lots of physicists like Roger Penrose who are happy to extend physics to accommodate mind and consciousness, but probably aren't so happy to extend it to include the spiritual domains. But by, I am, because as I explained at the beginning, I've always been obsessed, well, obsessed, intrigued by these three worlds and, and trying to connect them. I had a question, but I think I already have an answer. Basically, I was wondering, when I was preparing the questions, I was wondering if somebody has a strong scientific background, is it a hindrance? Or is it a more of a help, really, to investigate and to explain this, uh, you know, parapsychological phenomena? But I think you kind of already answered that. No, no, I would, uh, I would like to answer that because yeah. it's actually both. Mm. I mean, first of all, it's a help because, of course, science 
has a way of proceeding, a way of understanding the world. You focus on certain phenomena and you try and produce theories and, 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 and then the, the, you do the experiments which will modify the theory. And we need to know that. If you want to, if you want to study these phenomena scientifically, you need to have a scientific background. And in particular, if you want a theory, if I want a theory of physics, which is going to accommodate these phenomena, I have to understand the normal theories of physics. And of course, I am a physicist. And in a funny way, I sort of became a, a physicist because I thought, well, if I'm going to extend physics to accommodate psi, I better understand physics. That's why I became a professional physicist. But so obviously, being a scientist helps study these phenomena. And indeed, being a scientist would help you study any, any phenomena which is in the scientific domain. It's a hindrance in, in the sociological sense that most scientists don't believe in these phenomena. Or at least if they do, they, they're not prepared to talk about it. I actually think more scientists are interested in these things will, than will admit publicly because it's, it's parapsychology, psychical research, is a taboo word. And even to express an interest in this subject can get you into trouble in, an, in the academic context. You might, you might lose your job, or you won't get a research grant, you won't get promotion. So uh, from a sociological perspective, the fact that the main, most scientists, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say most, but a large number of scientists and physicists in particular don't believe in the phenomena, that does affect you. That is a hindrance. And, and it's, in some sense, it's, uh, for the individual, it's a bit concerning if you know if I know most of my physics colleagues don't believe in the phenomena they think I'm wasting my life so obviously that has a negative effect but more practically if you don't get grants to study the phenomena that also affects things because you've got to realize that although psychical research has been going on for 140 years it has tiny resources the amount of money it gets for research the number of people who are involved in research is tiny compared to mainstream psychology, let alone mainstream biology and other areas. So I would say science is both a plus and a minus. It's a plus from a theoretical perspective, but it's a minus from a sociological perspective. But it is interesting to say that actually, within the UK at least, there has been a lot of progress. You can now do a PhD in parapsychology. And believe it or not, there have been more than 100 PhDs in parapsychology in the United Kingdom alone. They're working in psychology departments. And, and there are now about a dozen universities where you have courses on parapsychology. So that's progress. And quite a lot of those PhDs have gone on to get academic jobs. They're professors in parapsychology now. So there has been progress. So although I'm saying there's a mainstream opposition, it, it, I don't mean complete opposition, because there are PhDs and professors in the subject. So there's been a huge improvement. But I have to say, within physics, I think there have been no PhDs and there are no professors in paraphysics, for example. So it depends which, which academic area you're looking at. Well, when you say, I'm thinking out loud, when you, when you say they don't believe, you don't mean it in belief, like believe in God. You, you mean it believe in the sense they don't, they are not open-minded to accept the possibility that it can be real, right? That it can be, that, in that sense, belief. That yeah. when you say belief, it could be religious. We don't mean, mean religious belief into something that we cannot, uh, we cannot prove or we cannot explain. Well, that's an interesting question because I would say the extreme skeptics, the ones who don't believe the phenomena at all, I would say they are rather like the extreme religious people. You have the fundamentalist Christians, for example, and, and I say they have a rather narrow view of the world where they, they have the truth and nobody else has. That's fundamental religion. Blind which, dogma. Blind dogma. And I would say the skeptics, although they're anti-religion, they're normally atheists as well, I would say the blind skeptics are equally fundamentalist because they, they have an all, their, their skepticism is almost based on faith. And so, for example, you'll have physicists say, and sometimes my friends will say, Psi can't be real because it's incompatible with the laws of physics. I don't even need to look at the data because I know it can't be true. 
To me, that's a terrible attitude, but it's an attitude some people say. I don't need to look at the data because I know it can't be true. In other words, they refuse to look through the telescope. You're going back to Galileo, where people wouldn't look through the telescope. And so I think people like that are refusing to look through the telescope. It's almost opposite of science, isn't it? But because it's, science me, should be exactly, open to explore exactly. all the avenues should, and all the roads. It should be open. Explain the reality, all the reality, not exactly. just segment of it. Absolutely. It should be, op it should be open and, and it can be skeptical in the sense that it's always questioning. But I think that is really crucial. But on the other hand, I, well, and all, I should say these people, the physicists, I'm talking about physicists now, some physicists will say these phenomena can't be real <clears throat> because they're not compatible with the laws of physics and the laws of physics have been tested with great precision in both quantum theory and relativity theory. But we don't have a final theory of physics. We know quantum theory, which works so well in the microscopic domain, and relativity theory, which works in the macroscopic domain, they, they work beautifully in their own domains. But we know those theories are not compatible. The final theory of physics has to go beyond relativity and quantum theory. And we don't know what that final theory is. That's what everyone is looking for, the final theory of physics. At least some people are looking for we cannot possibly say that final theory of physics is not going to allow consciousness because we don't know what that theory of physics is. And my own view, and, and I'm echoing what Roger Penrose says here, my own view is that that final theory of physics will make some reference to consciousness and, and mind. And that's what I think is so important. But there's another, another group of physicists, though, who, who don't dismiss the phenomena. They merely say... Oh, I can accept these phenomena are real, but they're just not part of physics. They, they will say, well, physics is to do with the third person description of the world. And experience, consciousness involves the first person description. And they will simply say, that's fine. I accept that these experiences happen. It's just not part of physics. And, and maybe quite a, maybe a third of physicists take that view. Um, more, more than a third, actually. Maybe the majority take that view. I, though, take the view that physics can be expanded to accommodate these phenomena, consciousness and, and the psi, and even spiritual experience. That's more controversial. But I would say with time, the, the, the number of people in that third category is growing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and I think that's important. But you also have to realise that every time you extend physics, you're, you're, or indeed expand science, because physics is just a sub-branch of science. Every time you get a new paradigm, because that's what we're talking about, a new paradigm to accommodate consciousness, every time you get a new paradigm in, physics, in science, you're, you're subtly changing the nature of science itself. And it may be when you've got this expanded paradigm which accommodates mind and spirit, it may not be science in the way people use that term previously. So that's the, that's the caveat, I would add. But in some sense, I want to expand science and I want to expand physics to accommodate these phenomena. I was wondering if some of the psychical phenomena that you, uh, that you investigated or studied uh, could be explained by the phenomenon of time or, or a concept of a species present. Maybe you explain a little bit what that doctrine is first. Okay. Well, many phenomena, many psi phenomena do involve time. For example, uh, a premonition where you see the future obviously involves time, or retrocognition where you see something in the past. It, it involves time, but not the normal physical time, because this is, isn't compatible with our normal concept of physical time. Uh, apparitions. People see ghosts, you know, the traditional ghost story is that you visit the haunted house and they see the same, the same ghost enacting the same scene. It's as though you're seeing a film clip from the past. So in some sense, it's as though the past has been frozen and, and it somehow is being shown again in the present. There's a whole range of phenomena which are, involves what you might call synchronicity, coincidences, which are game. A synchronicity means two events occur at the same time. Happen at the time. right time, also, yeah. So it seems to me, no doubt, that time is crucial to, to Psi. And indeed, I would say 
understanding time is crucial to the understanding of consciousness. If we're going to have a final theory of consciousness, it's going to have a, an understanding of, of the final theory of time as well. Because although physicists understand time to some extent, they don't, they don't have a final theory. They understand time in the physical world. But that's only part of it. And, and there are many features of time which we don't understand as physicists. The most fundamental question is, what is the passage of time? Consciousness means we're aware of the flow of time. You know, the, the future becomes the present, becomes the past. But the problem is that passage of time cannot be described by relativity theory. Relativity theory is the physicist's way of understanding time. You know, it merges space and time as part of a four-dimensional space-time, and that works very successfully. But relativity theory has what they call the block universe, where the past, present, and future coexist. There is no passage of time. And, and so many people conclude that the present moment, which is what we experience as conscious beings, doesn't really exist from a physical perspective. It purely, it's purely a feature of mind. Many philosophers, almost most philosophers, conclude that the passage of time is an illusion, or at least it exists only as a result of mind. It's not a feature of the physical world. And a lot of physicists will agree that there is nothing in the physics which actually tells you what is the physical moment now. Because if you have the ordinary laws of physics, the past and the future are determined entirely in terms of the present. So, so there's no distinction between now. There's nothing to highlight now. That's what some physicists say. But I know there is a passage of time. I do experience the passage of time. Also, I don't believe in the block universe because I think I can make a decision. I can, I can make a decision whether to, to go left or, or go right, whether to continue the interview or stop the interview. I can make a decision. And that is not compatible with the idea of a block universe because the block universe says that there is a definite future which you cannot avoid. Well, it may be my... No free will, no, then. No free will. Now, maybe that's an illusion. Maybe I only think I've got a decision as to whether to carry on being interviewed or disappear. But I, I don't think that. I think there is a... But my, my argument is that you have to go beyond relativity theory. You need another time dimension. I say that the experience of time requires another time dimension. It's, the, it's mental time, if you like, rather than physical time. And... and in my view, mental time is different from physical time. So you actually have a five-dimensional picture. You've got the four-dimensional space-time, which physicists study, the third-person domain. But there's also this fifth dimension. So you've really got a five-dimensional model. And one slice of that, if you like, is the physical world, and the other slice is the mental world. That's my own view. Again, it may not be the, the mainstream view. And so in, in my own theory, in my own theory, you've got to go beyond relative. You have to go beyond special relativity. You have to invoke this extra dimension. And what's interesting, of course, is that physics itself talks about extra dimensions now. There's a M, M theory, for example, has got um, eleven dimensions. M theory is, is the current favoured model for a theory of everything, and it's got eleven dimensions. So you've got the three dimensions of space and the one dimension of time. So those are what we call the macroscopic dimensions. But you've got these extra dimensions, which are all wrapped up. But they're in the simplest picture. They're all wrapped up very small. They're compactified on, on a scale of what's called the Planck length, which is very very small, ten to the minus thirty three centimeters. So we never see these extra dimensions because they're compactified. But nevertheless, they exist according to some of these popular theories of physics. And, and not all physicists believe these theories. Some people say it's just mathematics because they've not been tested. But the fact is that some of the smartest physicists on the planet, on the planet think about these things. So that's extra dimensions coming from mainstream physics. One of these theories, uh, a version of M theory says that you extend one of these dimensions. So instead of being wrapped up very small, it's extended. So you've got a five dimensional model. And in this picture, the physical world, the material world, is like a four dimensional slice. It's called a brain, B R A N E, 
and it's in this higher dimensional bulk. That's just the term they use. And in what's called brain cosmology, which goes a bit beyond that, that says our, in, because cosmology is the large scale structure of the universe, this sheet, this brain actually moves through the bulk. Well, I relate that to my higher dimensional model of time, because if you can think of four dimensional space time, it's sort of moving through this fifth dimension associated with mental time. And you can see that's rather similar to the idea of a brain moving through this five dimensional bulk. So I actually associate this extra dimension, which describes mind and consciousness with this extra dimension that comes out of physics. I have to say, this is my own theory. I doubt any other physicists believe it, or I don't know, think many brain cosmologists will like that theory because by and large, they, they don't want to bring mind into it. But my, my feeling is this, if the world is really, say, five dimensional, as like the bulk, and we're only on a slice of this five dimensional space, what else is there in the rest of the space off the bulk? Well, the only thing I'm aware of is my mental world, my, my dreams, my memories, my visualizations, my out of body experiences, my near death experiences. So to me, it's very natural to try and say that these experiences can be described in terms of this higher dimensional space. The only thing is that uh, it may not just be five dimensional, there may be more than five dimensions. So it, um, but the, the key point is the, the realization that there is a reality which goes beyond the normal material reality, which is just that four dimensional brain. But nevertheless, this, it's a higher dimensional reality which is still being described by equations and by laws of physics because they're coming from the physicists who study M theory. And that's why I'm saying this is in some sense an extension of physics to the mental domain. And, and that's what I feel rather, rather passionate about. But what is then the relationship between time and, and this mental domain or consciousness, whatever we want to call it? Well, in the picture I've just described mm -hmm. to you, the fifth dimension is actually the mental time. So this extra domain actually contains mind and mental time, because there's this link always between time and, and consciousness. And, and so, you see, the, the normal view is that the material world is real. Okay, so what we mean by that is that it's, table, this, is the, this is the real world <laughs> in the chair. sense that we are all perceiving the world, but we perceive it from different directions and different ways because we're localized. But nevertheless, th there is a three-dimensional real world out there. And the existence of that world explains why all of our views of the world are concordant. Okay, there's you and I, we're seeing the world in different ways, but how we see the world is consistent because there is a three-dimensional reality. So we say, what is real? Three-dimensional. That's the classical view. And we, say, we have the same apparatus, so to speak. We right? have the same, uh, so we, we're two brains, yeah. we're localized yeah. in three-dimensional space, we're looking around at your teacup in three-dimensional space. And, but once we know where we are and where the teacup is, we can reconcile how we see the world. The trouble is that's wrong, because Einstein told us that actually the reality is really four-dimensional. We don't notice it because you only notice it if you're moving at near the speed of light or in a strong gravitational field. But actually, the only way to consistently reconcile how people observe the world is to say it's four-dimensional. So you've got a four-dimensional reality, and that's standard physics. What I'm saying is that actually, reality is more than four-dimensional. There are higher dimensions, and these higher dimensions are to do with mind. Now, you see, the standard view is that of the, of the the sort of materialist, reductionist view is that my mind is just inside my brain. Your mind is inside your brain. So our minds are completely separate. And it's a result of uh, neural activity. As right? a result yeah. of neural activity. So there's a physical world out there, signals come in through the eyes and go into the yeah. visual cortex. And, but the idea is that my mind is entirely inside my head and your mind is entirely inside your head. If what I'm telling you is correct, that there's this higher dimensional mental space our minds are just part of a bigger mind. Okay, it's, it's, it's a universal mind, if you like, with a capital M. And 
it seems we're just in our heads because by and large, we, we can't see beyond uh, outside our senses, except in altered states of consciousness. So we get the impression our mind is in our head. But I argue that actually the mind isn't in the head. I mean, clearly there are things going on in the brain which correlate with your experience. But my claim is that the mind itself, the experience itself, is not in the head. In fact, to, from my perspective, the, the experience is the outside, is space-time. When you're talking about the physical world, the experience is space-time itself. Mm. And, and it's just, uh, there is a correlation with what goes on in your brain. But your phenomenal space isn't actually inside your brain. Your phenomenal space really is the outside world, although distorted in various ways. But that's when you're dealing with the physical world. But what about these other realms, the mental and spiritual realms? I claim they're also part of a, a, of a connected reality, a universal, what you might call a universal mind, but it's, it's mind with a capital M, as distinct from my individual mind with a capital little M. Or if you like, it's consciousness with a big C as opposed to the consciousness with a little C, which I have. So you're actually equating the word mind with the word consciousness? Uh, well, that's a bit complicated. I mean, consciousness can be understood in different ways, but certainly mind, uh, consciousness, if you're dealing with contents of consciousness, that relates to the mind. So obviously the two ideas are linked. But the point is, to me, that's the prime message of parapsychology, actually, the phenomena of parapsychology, that our minds are connected. They're not just separate. They're part of this universal mind. Now, we don't notice that because the brain is designed to cut out all of this other uh, psychic information, if you like. Unnecessary, it, I guess, right? It, it, in other words, it, it's saying that the brain is not the generator of consciousness. The brain is a filter of consciousness. Okay, so you've got the big C, which is filtered through the brain because the brain is sufficiently sophisticated to generate memories and images of localized the experience basically. localizing yeah. exactly mm -hmm. it localizes it but the, the to me the message of all the psychical research is that and other experiences is that the mind is non-local that minds are connected so it would be rather like if we were all in prison cells okay you think all that exists is your prison cell because you can't see anything outside your cell but actually we know the prison cells are all connected as part of a physical world. It's just that you haven't opened the prison door and been let out. I, I think minds are like that. We're locked into our own little prison, so we think that's all there is, but they're disconnected. But once you open the door, you find all these, and all the prisoners are let out, they find they're all connected. That's my view, anyway. And I think that's the, I think that's the fundamental finding of psychical research. Not just psychical research, more natural phenomena. Uh, Creativity, genius, uh, mystical experience. I think all of these are, are evidence that you've got non-local mind. But this has the important implication that the brain is a filter rather than a generator of consciousness. And that is a view which I imagine 90% of neuroscientists at least wouldn't accept. But I think there is evidence. I think there is evidence that for the filter theory. I think there's evidence that Sometimes when the brain is shutting down, your experience is, is more real and brighter. I mean, the obvious example is a near-death experience. Your brain is, is dying, it's flatlined, and yet you're experiencing things as, as vividly as ever. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There are experiences where psychedelics, where the bits of the brain you might think will be activated are deactivated, and yet you're seeing a whole new experience, the realm of experience. There's a terminal lucidity. People who are suffering from Alzheimer's and yet just before they die, it suddenly become lucid. It's as though the closing down of the brain actually makes them more aware. aware. Yeah. More aware. And to me, that is fascinating. And uh, it's not so easy experimentally to distinguish between the producer and the filter theory of, of consciousness. But I think if Psy is real, I think that's the message, that you, it's a brain is a filter, there is a universal mind, and that's why you, our minds are connected through telepathy and clairvoyance. This universal mind also contains the material world, because it's just one slice of the material world. That's at least my, my own view. Now, 
you originally asked in your question about the specious present. That's another uh, uh, Before we go bit that, of a tangent. I, but I have a burning question. Okay. Uh, is, is time objective or not in this case? Well. Does it exist if we hadn't existed? Which, because we have singularity where there is no time. Which, which, which question is, which time do you mean? Yeah, what is if, time then? If you Another mean burning. time, the physical time which is measured by clocks in the physical world, one would say that is objective. It's part of the third person description of standard physics. That's described by Einstein's relativity theory and certainly that is describing what is objective. If by objective you mean, in some sense, consensual reality, okay? Because the word objective says there's an outside reality and physical time is part of that consensual reality. So it is objective in that sense. However, if you ask about mental time, the passage of time, many physicists would say that is not objective because there's nothing in physics which says this is now. There's no, nothing in physics which describes this passage. And so a physicist would say that time is not objective. But remember, that's because you're associating objectivity with this lower dimensional level of reality. If you've got a higher level of reality, and that higher level of reality contains another dimension of time, that has an objectivity. Because the whole point about this approach is you're, the distinction between subjective and objective is being removed. You think there's an outside world there and the subjective world in my brain. But what I'm saying is no, there's, it's not inside your brain. The subjective world is actually a reflection in the objective world. And that even the mental world which you experience in dreams and altered states of consciousness, I'm saying that's also part of a communal reality. And therefore in that sense it's also objective. If by objective you mean real. So I would say yeah, time is, a, is objective once you adopt this extended view of reality. But it's not objective, exter well, mental time is not objective from the current view of physics, which just focuses on the material world. Now... But what is time then? What, what is time? Well, what I've said to you, what, what I've claimed time? to you, and of course this could all be wrong, because remember <laughs> philosophers have been debating this for a thousand years. But what I'm saying to you, when you say what is time, you have to distinguish between the different levels of time. I mean, it's easy to answer your question as a straightforward classical physicist. I say there is just time is the thing measured by clocks. But what I'm saying to you is no, it's not as simple as that. Because when you talk about mental experience, you have to invoke another time, even if most physicists aren't happy with that. And nor is it as simple as that, because actually I would argue there are, there's more than one mental time. I would argue there's a hierarchy of times. And to explain that, I have to get into a discussion of specious present. Would you like me to talk about specious present? First of all, I should preface this by saying I'm going to say something which, again, most of my physicist friends probably won't take seriously. But the point about conscious experience is that it not only involves a passage of time, which I, I've explained with this extra dimension, it also involves a specious present. And the specious present is the shortest time you're aware of. In other words, you can't resolve it into past, present and future. Now for a human being, the specious present is about a tenth of a second. Okay? So what I mean is, I, I often do a little demonstration with a light, but I'm going to do it with a, my finger. You imagine a light goes round, you see that as motion. If the light goes round more than 10 times a second, you don't see it as motion, you see a continuous light. In other words, time in some sense has become space, perceptually. Because our brain only can't resolve things on a time scale less than a tenth of a second. And actually, if the light goes round too slowly, you won't see motion either. It's that's to do with the memory time scale, which might be um, many hours or something. But the point is, our experience of the passage of time only involves a very narrow range of time scales. Okay, and in particular, uh, this specious presence in the tenth, is a tenth of a second. 
And humans very arrogantly assert that this is the only level of consciousness in the universe. They assume that Homo sapiens is the, is the culmination of, of, of evolution. And that Aren't we? We are conscious. <laughs> I don't think so. We are on this planet, yeah. yeah. We are on this planet, but maybe not in the universe. But they assume that we're the only level of consciousness in the universe. But how do we know? Because the point, it's rather like looking, light. You know, we only observe in the, in the optical range, which is a very narrow wave band compared to the whole range of electromagnetic radiation. I'm saying the same thing about consciousness. We assume that consciousness, our consciousness with a specious present of a tenth of a second is all there is. I don't see why there shouldn't be levels of consciousness on all sorts of physical scales with very different specious presence because there are structures, physical structures in the universe on all sorts of different scales, not just human beings. And we can't exclude the fact that they're in some sense conscious and alive, but the specious present would be very different. You might even argue that the planet Earth, this will sound very new agey, but you might argue the planet Earth has a sort of collective consciousness because it's got a collective memory, a collective intelligence, a collective stupidity, <laughs> as seen by all the wars going on and things like that, by the fact we're destroying ourselves. But, but nevertheless, there is a sense in which you could argue the planet Earth has got a, a sense of a personal identity. I'm not going to say the Earth is conscious, but it could be in some level. And then it could be when we start making contact with aliens in the galaxy, other civilizations in the galaxy, maybe we become part of the great galactic internet. And so in some sense, maybe we become part of a great galactic consciousness, but on a much longer time scale. Or maybe eventually we become part of some great cosmic consciousness, which operates on a cosmological time scale. But we can't prove these different levels of consciousness exist because the whole point is that consciousness with the specious present can't interact with each other. You can only interact with the consciousness having roughly the same time scale. You know, if, if mountains talk to each other on a time scale of a, ten, a million years, you're not going to be able to speak, to speak to them. I'm not claiming mountains are speaking to each other, but I'm just trying to illustrate that. So it seems to me incredibly arrogant, and I don't see why there shouldn't be consciousness on a time scale of uh, a million years. You know, maybe some extra galactic civilization has a specious present of a, a million years. Or maybe... Uh, there's a, a form of consciousness on a time scale of a nanosecond. Maybe compute, people argue about whether computers are going to develop consciousness. Well, maybe they will develop a consciousness, but maybe the specious present will be a nanosecond because they think much faster. So I take the view that the universe, even considered from a physical point of view, may ex exhibit consciousness on all sorts of different levels, but we just wouldn't be aware of it in a normal stage of consciousness, because our normal stage of consciousness is a specious present of a tenth of a second. Well, you might say, well, that's not very useful because you can't, how do you prove it? Well, why? It's interesting. It's because I think there are certain altered states of consciousness in which we can change our specious present. Mm. I mean, th this is incontrovertible to some extent. We know our specious present changes in certain experiences. If you're falling off a mountain, time seems to slow down. I'm not talking from experience, but I'm just... Yeah, people say that. Here. But I did, I did fall. I was doing mountaineering. And, uh, you have climbing. fallen down. Well, then yeah, you, I, I, you do fall. When you come down, you do through a set of falls. Well, so, this is wonderful. I should now be asking you the question. <laughs> but, but the point is that... Yeah, is, it's a different experience. That's fascinating. On, so on, there on are the situations where different? your time actually... Slow, the outside world slows down, so your specious presence, in some sense, becomes uh, smaller. It's expanding, actually, internally. Yeah, yeah but your, your, your specious present becomes sm smaller, so that you're actually, the, the out external time uh, seems to slow down. You, know, you have many internal moments. I, I can't external. judge, because all you have is, is inner experience. Yeah, yeah. And no. that inner experience is actually expanding. Yeah, but this is... So this the is, feeling of expansion... This, the just a semantic point. Yeah. If the outside yeah. world slows down, that yeah, means yeah. you have that's many correct. external moments for each yeah. external. Yeah, that's so correct. your specious present yeah. is then shrinking. But you, al uh, you also have experiences where your specious present expands. And there's a nice story of someone who was ill with a fever and saw this flicking light by the, flickering light by the window. And it turned out it was the rising and setting of the sun. But it had been speeded up. And the reason was because his, 
Beecher's present has expanded, okay, which meant that in a certain amount of his internal time, a, a lot of external time flowed. So it's a, that's an expansion. Now, presumably, those effects can be described by what goes on in the brain, because they're probably some form of clock inside the brain. But, but they're more dramatic experiences, which I suspect can't be described by what goes on in the brain. If you have, there's a famous case where Rupert Brooke was pouring tea for his girlfriend and all of a sudden time froze. And so it was the solid... For him. For him, time froze. The, the tea was um, solid, just solid, just static coming out of the teapot. And he wrote a beautiful poem which was inspired by this mystical moment. Now, I know you filled your teacup a short time ago, so maybe you can fill it again and see if time freezes. But nevertheless, this was an experience he had and that we would describe Spontaneously. it as... Spontaneously. Spontaneously, it, 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 not it, a meditation it, or anything it, like that. He didn't expect it to happen, it just yes. happened as okay. a result of this, okay. and he, he inspired a poem. And then later on, of course, he went back into real time and it started flowing again. But that's a, that's a situation where your specious present sort of it basically freezes to zero, it shrinks to zero because only now exists. But there are other situations where your species presence expands. You have a near-death experience and you see your whole life in one go. No distinction between past and future. Yeah. Past, it just, you see your whole life in one go. And that's because in this way of talking, your species present has expanded to something like 100 years. Uh, and so I think there is evidence that the species present can actually change and that when it changes like this I say I would say your consciousness has gone beyond the brain you remember I talked about the brain being filter I would say this is evidence actually that the brain is a filter because you're now ex you're big there are these different levels of consciousness and in some sense you become you've lost your individual identity and you become merged with this higher level of identity so once you've got this higher level of identity uh, you, you, are no, you are no longer yourself, you are no longer Natalia, you, you are actually a higher level of self. But I, I would claim you can experience that, either through falling off a mountain. Well, no, falling off a mountain probably has a simple physical brain-based explanation, but if, I would say that if you have a near-death experience or a mystical experience, I would say that you can, or, or even a cup of tea, I would claim that you may be able to access these different levels of consciousness and different levels of identity. So if you were to ask me what is the evidence for these theories, I would say it comes from experience, not through scientific experiments, because we can't do that yet, but I would say it comes from experience. But I think as long as the brain is functioning you know, in, any, in any form or shape, people can say it's the brain which is doing that, yes. right? So I think the closest to a, a proof, if we could say that, would be a near-death experience where there is a flat line in the brain and people experience it. That, is, of, right? that is true. I mean, right? I was sort of saying the very fact that you're experiencing your whole life uh, means you have to go beyond the brain, but that was meant to be independent of whether you flatlined in some sense. But I was arguing just by the very nature of the experience, it can't be explained by the brain. How can the brain present your whole life in one go? But certainly it can't predict your future life, and sometimes people see their future life as well as their past life. However, that's more contentious. Some, some people say, you know, we don't understand the brain. How can I say the brain can't experience the whole of your life in one go? So maybe I'm wrong there, but, but the flatlining of the brain is perhaps more relevant to say that it goes beyond the brain. But, but uh, I just think, though, that there are that consciousness is a hierarchy of consciousness, and and that although normally we're locked into our brain, sometimes even when you're alive, you're able to access those higher levels of the hierarchy. And I have I have my own theory, which is even more speculative than anything I've said so far. In these in these higher dimensional theories of physics, the extra dimensions are compactified. You remember that. They're normally compactified on the Planck scale, but in one, you extend one theory. One, one dimension is extended in, in, in the brain picture, the brain in the bulk picture. And so I like the idea that you actually all of the extra dimensions are compactified on different scales. And, and in some sense, the hierarchy of co scales of compactification in my model corresponds to the hierarchy of specious presence and the hierarchy of consciousness. But 
this is my picture, it's not the mainstream picture of physics, nor is it the mainstream picture of philosophers or indeed the mainstream pictures of mystics. It's just my particular model, but it's just, a, it may be wrong, it may be crazy, but it's just a way of illustrating how in principle you may be able to ex relate physics to experience. Well, you might ask, how does this concept of the specious presence explain certain psychic phenomena? Well, that's quite a big topic, but just to give a simple example, the point about the specious present is that there's no distinction between past, present and future. And therefore, from an experiential point of view, within a time scale of a tenth of a second, there's no distinction between past, present and future. And a funny way in this theory, I'm associating consciousness almost with closed time-like curves. You have what are called time -like, closed time-like curves, which loop in time. And, and in this approach, I am associating consciousness with a closed time-like curve, which is a rather strange concept, but, it, but that's nevertheless the, the picture. But then you ask yourself, well, what happens if the specious present gets longer? Say my specious presence, instead of being a tenth of a second, say it expands to an hour. Well then, what is in the future for the rest of the world, an hour ahead, it, for my experience, is, is current because there is no distinction between past, present and future. And so maybe even I extend my specious present for a day and then I'm seeing what's in the future by a day. So you can see how one particular psychic phenomena, premonition, might be explained by extending my specious present. But then, and that's to do with, uh, if you like, passive psychic experiences, seeing the future. There are other experiences where you're actually affecting the physical world. In that situation, I argue the specious present is shrunk. And again, the reason for this is a little bit technical. It's just that it, in certain models, when you, when you affect a physical object, like I, I focus on a, a cup and I move the cup, if you believe that phenomenon, most physicists don't, but if you do, I think you have to say that you're imparting information rather than energy. So you imagine all these atoms, you're made, telling all of the atoms to move to the left. So you're giving them the information, move to the left. So if that's true, it's only one model of psi, if that's true, it means PK depends on transfer of information. But information, if it's coming from, from the brain, the brain can only generate information at a certain rate. Now, if you decrease the specious present, the information rate can go up. And so on this argument, you would say that PK was associated with a decrease of the specious present, but the versions, various forms of ESP are associated with an increase of the specious present. So this, that discussion may be rather too technical, and, and no one else may believe it except me, but at least I think that that's one possible model which relates the change in the specious present to various different types of psychic phenomena. All right. Um, I would like to ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Natalia, I go was ahead. fascinated when you said yeah. that you would experience the slowing down of time when you fell off a mountain. Would you like to elaborate on that? I don't know. I can't even describe that it was slowing down. It's just almost stopped. That was the feeling. It's, it's an inner feeling of things expanding within. So not, you don't register uh, external world do normally, do, do we normally register? And things are expanding and things like stopping and slowing down a little bit like that. When so you say the... time stopped, you meant in what sense? In the sense that the outside world stopped. It slowed down so much. We said how in an accident, when you fall off a mountain, the outside world slows down. So when you say time stopped, do you mean the outside world froze? I, I can't even describe. Maybe another, another, another example would be better. Mm -hmm. um, I started diving some, some long time ago, and then, but um, the first time we went diving into the depth, so mm -hmm. it was 40 meters underneath. Uh, even though I had a prior experience of rock climbing, when, when, we, uh, when I looked down and under me was this depth, mm -hmm. something happened. I just 
it's just all expanded. You know, I had this feeling of an enormous, uh, how to say it? Um, like an out of body experience? Or? I can't even say. I just felt this universe is so enormous that everything is so vast and I'm just part of it. Yeah. Maybe a unity experience. I don't know how you call it. So. That is a, a, a common feature of mystical experience. And, I mean, and at that moment, the, the feeling is that the time either doesn't exist at all, or it just froze. Yes. It's just yeah. not in the, the picture the, at all. I the, mean, first of all, this experience of becoming one with the universe, that's a common feature, almost a defining feature. Yeah, but the time is gone. It's out of picture. Experience. It's completely out of picture. Yes. But then sometimes people say time ceases to exist. Yeah. And... I would only say you have to be very careful between time ceasing to exist and, and your species present changing. Because if you see your whole life, okay, in one go, as you do in a near-death experience, you might say time ceases to exist. But it might just mean your species presence is so long that it looks like your whole life exists at one moment. But you're still, the very fact you're still conscious in some sense may mean there is still an internal time. So it's a distinction between an internal time, which you're experiencing, and the outside time, which, which is the description of your, your life, which you're seeing. But, you know, Bernard, I can relate a little bit. It's not exactly the same, but I can relate. There is this movie where, uh, I don't remember the name, it was Jodie Foster, I think and about their building a special craft where they dropped her in a capsule. Yes, of course. Where yes, they drop yes. her in a capsule mm -hmm. and she experiences all kinds of things. And when by the time she arrives, um, it, 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 the passage of time exactly. outside I know, I, was kind of normal, right? I, I, Almost I, I, normal. I know the movie but very well. You, you know, right? Yeah. But inside, she had her own experience. She had no feeling for time outside. And that, that's a little bit the experience I'm describing. You have no feeling for time outside. You just expand within. You have your own inner experience. Exactly. I mean, I, th I think that movie was called Contact, I yeah, think. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Contact. Yeah, yeah. And the whole point was, as you say, her internal time is, is yeah. vastly different from yeah. the external time. Yeah. But, but again, she's not transcending time, she's just experiencing time in a different yes, way. So yes, yes. I was only questioning whether there is um, a, one really has transcended time or merely transcended the normal experience of time. That's all yeah. I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting when you refer to movies because there are lots of movies that have this concept. I mean, for example, there's a lovely movie called Inception, which is all about hierarchy of dreamings, dreams within dreams within dreams. And how they each, ha in my language, they each have a different species present. So that movie, to me, really encapsulates this whole concept of a hierarchy of species present. There's also the, the, the movie Interstellar, a more, a more recent movie, which I thought was a great movie. But you might remember in that movie, a person goes into a black hole and then goes back in time. And, and it, but this movie invokes, in some sense, this extra dimension uh, to, to get back in time. But what's interesting about that movie, because the idea of, of, of closed time like hers arises in relativity. There are solutions in relativity theory, which in uh, some sense allow you to go back in time. Uh, not all physicists like it. They try and exclude it. But it's in principle, they might, they're allowed. And in the movie Interstellar, someone goes back in time. But what's interesting is that the movie explicitly associates this idea of going back in time, this higher dimension, if you like, with mind, because it's a mental experience. And that's what I personally found fascinating about that movie. I'm not sure if it was intentional, but it was in a certain sense making a link between mind, mind space and, and physical space. It's actually raised to one of the questions I have, because uh, we also interviewed uh, Donald Hoffman, Professor Hoffman, know. you know, and um, he just said that uh, time, time is just a dial on a dashboard. And once we hack it, we will be able to manipulate it. Would you agree to that? Well, this is very interesting, I, because I certainly agree with some of the things that Donald Hoffman says. Mm. But this last point you raise is particularly interesting. What Donald Hoffman says is that Ultimately, physics 
the final description of physics will transcend space and time altogether. I talked about the final theory of physics. Mm -hmm. That's to do with quantum gravity, okay? That's when you merge relativity and quantum theory, you have the theory of quantum gravity. And the crucial question is, in your final theory, what will be the role of space and what will be the role of time? Some people take the view that space is emergent and, and, and time is the only reality. Other people take the view that no, time is emergent and space is the, is the only reality. Uh, these sort of correspond to string theory and what's called loop quantum gravity. But there's another view which simply says that both space and time are emergent. In other words, in the final theory of physics, they won't play any role. They, but they emerge. Obviously, they're part of our description of the world now. But in, if you go back to the Big Bang or if, uh, the, when the final theory applies, space and time don't exist. And, and that could well be true. There, there are eminent physicists who argue that the final description of physics will not involve space and time. So what Donald Hoffman says is, he says, right, because we want our description without space and time is actually going, to, that's what's going to, that's how consciousness is going to come in, because some experiences seem to transcend space and time. So that might seem rather natural. So he pushes the view that this, the way in which you're going to reconcile mind with physics is at this final level where there's no space and time. Now, my approach is subtly different because I'm saying, actually, mental experience, spiritual experiences do involve space and time, but it's not the normal space and time. It's an extended space and time. And so that might seem to be different, but it's an interesting point. I've been talking about these experiences as though they involve a change in the specious present. And I've been emphasizing that what, when people think they're transcending time, maybe they're only just experiencing time in a different way. However, what's interesting to me is that if you look in the, some of the religious literature, it claims there is a mystical state in which you're, you really do transcend space and time. Uh, your, specious, your specious present may become so small, almost zero, that only the now exists. That's one mystical state. But there's another mystical state in which your specious present almost becomes infinite. So the whole history of the universe <laughs> is seen in one go. So not just your life is seen as one go, the whole history of the universe is seen as one go. So this gives rise to the idea that, well, maybe there is an ultimate state in which space and time are transcended. It's just that these other lesser states, like near-death experiences, etc., they're just a step on the way. They involve an extended view of space and time before you get to the completely timeless state, timeless, spaceless state. So, and I have to stress, I've not had any of these experiences. I should ask you if you have, but I've not had any of these experiences, so I'm just talking hypothetically. But I do think that when you go through the hierarchy of states of consciousness, I do think there may be an ultimate level where you actually transcend it altogether. You, know, you transcend space and time altogether. That would be what Donald Hoffman is referring to. And, but, but I would argue there's this intermediate state which still involves a sort of space and a sort of time. And so in that sense, I've, I've got a different view from Donald Hoffman. But, but on the other hand, I, I do agree with many aspects of his theory, which basically says that you know, our reality, we just, in a certain sense, you can say it's all a dream. So many of the religious philosophers has preached that the material world is just mayor, it's an illusion, it's all a dream. And I, I don't mind if at a certain level the physical world is a dream. The whole point about these sorts of higher dimensional theories is everything is ultimately in mind. Mind space is, encapsulates physical space. And so in a certain sense, you might say everything is a dream. Because if, if everything is in mind space, in a certain sense, it's semantics, but you might say everything is a dream. But the point is, is a hierarchy of dreams. So maybe the whole physical world is a dream, in, 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 in a certain sense of the word dream. But there's also dreams which I have when I fall asleep, and that's a different type of dream. So it's dreams within dreams within dreams, as with Inception. Regarding the species present concept, um, how would person for whom 
the world froze. For example, the teapot you were describing, that everything, the tea just became solid almost, right? So how that person then can interact with the world, which is at a different species present rate, so to speak? That's a very interesting question. And let's, get, let's take another example where you, it's not quite as dramatic. Let's take the example where you're in a car crash. You're driving along, you're in a car crash, and then what happens is that the outside world seems to slow down. Remember, that's your specious presence is, is actually getting smaller, but that the outside world therefore seems to slow down, okay? Because you have many internal moments for each external moment, so to speak. But then the question is, if that's the case, is your body able to react faster? Can your body, because you might think, well, the external world is slowing down, so I can move around and I can avoid the accident, you know, I can steer the steering wheel and things like that. On the other hand, you might say my body is part of the physical world and therefore my physical body is also slowed down. So when I try to move my hand, maybe to turn the steering wheel, my hand is also moving very slowly. So I'm seeing the other car in slow motion, but my hand is also moving very slowly. Now, I have not had this experience, so I don't know the answer, and I don't know if any research has been done into this. I suspect, though, because simply from a consistent point of view, that it probably means that your hand is also restrained to move slowly. So, on the other hand, people who've been in car accidents do affirm that they can think more quickly and relative to the outside world, and they know what evasive action to take to minimise the the damage. So even if they can't turn the steering wheel, they can analyse the problem more quickly. And, you, and it's interesting because having a car accident is rather dramatic and rather negative, but I think even in sports uh, you, you, you see this variation in the specious presence. If you're a tennis player, you've got to react to a tennis ball coming at 120 miles an hour. In theory, that's f far too f fast to react if you're acting on a specious presence of a tenth of a second. So I think that even sports people are experiencing a very different speed. Oh, they, some of them say that. Some of them say they see things in slow motion. And, and I think that's part of success in sports, that people actually change their speech as present. I'm not an expert on sports, so I can't really claim that. But this is what some people claim. Now there, in some sense, I think when you're this, I don't think it's, it's not actually making you move your hand any faster, but it does mean you're reacting and sending the signal to your hand quicker. So I think there is a subtle interaction between your physical body, even if it doesn't mean the, the actual body itself moving faster, because you know, if you're, it, your hand isn't moving any faster when you're playing tennis at, at top level, but your reaction, the, the time you tend to send the signal to the hand is, is getting faster. So it's a very difficult question, and one which I can't answer very, very clearly, but, uh, but I, I think there is an indication that in a certain sense you can improve your physical reaction, even if uh, your body itself still seems to move in slow motion. But what if our species presence is expanding? How does the body react then? Well, let's take the particular example of the person mm -hmm. in the, lying in the bed with a fever who right. sees the flicking light yeah. as the sun rises and sets. From my perspective, the implication of that is he, this person is unable to interact with the world on the normal time scale, precisely because he cannot do anything to interfere because he can't, if he wants to move something in the room, if he wants to uh, move the glass by his bed or something like that, the implication would be he can't do it because he's, his moment of now has, has, has expanded so much that he can't actually do anything on a time scale less than that. So that's the, the point about, the, when I said, the point about a specious presence is that you can't interact with a consciousness on either a much shorter or a much longer time scale, this applies to the interactions of your own bodies, your own body as well. So I would argue that in either case, 
you're not able to actually do anything physical. When, you're, when your specious presence is expanded, that means you're not able to do anything either because you can't interact with your body on a shorter time scale. You see, this, ex this experience of, of the flicking sun, flickering, flickering sun, in a way, is no different from what happens when you fall asleep or have an anaesthetic. If you have an anaesthetic, you lose consciousness. You wake up, no time has existed in between. So now imagine that every 12 hours you're given an anaesthetic. So you see the sun rise, you're given an anaesthetic, time doesn't exist. You wake up, the sun floats, you give another anaesthetic. You'd have the same experience. So in principle, there's no difference between this strange state and the state of just having lots of general anaesthetics. But the point is, if you ask your question then, how can you interact? I would say you can't. When you're having a general anaesthetic, you can't move your body. So it's the same argument again, that in either case, if you change the specious presence, it limits the extent to which your body, your own body, can interact with the rest of the world. But this is all speculation, because I've not had any of these experiences. I've not even had a general anaesthetic. And, and again, we are back to the, is it just a brain illusion, or, or, yeah. Yeah. or is it mm. really change of state in comparison to the other world? Yeah. Objective. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. I have another question. Um, every scientist, physicist, mathematicians, they say that our universe seems to be such a finely tuned system. However, where you, you look at it mathematically or from point of view of the physics, um, is it all by design or is it random? Well, this is a subject which I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in. In fact, I wrote a, a, a paper with Martin Rees in 1979 about these, an, these so-called anthropic fine-tunings. And again, it was rather controversial at the time because a lot of physicists didn't like the idea of fine-tuning because it, it, it sounded too philosophical or even theological. But the fact of the matter is that there are these relationships between the constants of physics which seem to be necessary in order for us to be here. Necessary in order to have galaxies and stars and planets and chemistry. And, and to me that's indisputable. There are these fine tunings but they're not explained by normal physics. And that's a real puzzle because if you, if you chose all your constants of physics randomly, life wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here asking questions about the universe. So the question is, how do you explain that? It's called the anthropic principle, by the way. Anthropos is the Greek word for man. Not sexist, I mean human, if you like. But it's a bad term because this is not really anything to do with humans in particular, but it's, that's the word we're stuck with. So the point is, how do you explain those fine-tunings? And broadly, there are two different approaches. One is to say that there was a creator who tailor-made the universe for life. And so the God, if you like, designed the universe so we could arise. So obviously that's a theological perspective. Physicists don't like that because physicists don't want to bring God into it. Physics is trying to get rid of God and explain things in terms of natural law. But the other explanation, which even way back in 1979, I think we, we, we were aware of, is to say, well, actually, maybe they're just many universes, maybe millions of universes, in all of which the constants are different, maybe randomly distributed. That's called the multiverse. And then it's merely saying we have to be in one of the universes where the uni where the constants are appropriate for life. So that's saying fine-tuning is a natural result of the fact you've got lots of universes. So you seem to have a choice between God and one universe, or no God and millions of universes. Now, by and large, physicists prefer the, the multiverse because they don't want to invoke God. Now, but 
cosmologists are split about the multiverse too, because some people, just as some people thought God is too theological, some people think the multiverse is too, <laughs> certainly too philosophical, because it's equally mysterious, because the point about the multiverse is there are all these other universes which you can't see. So is it science? If you can't see, how can it ever, if you can't prove they exist, how could it ever be regarded as science if I can't see something? Well, it's not quite as simple as that because physics is full of ideas, full of things which you can't see but you still believe in. You can never see inside a black hole, but it's still physics. You can never see a quark, the subatomic particle, but it's, people still believe in quarks. So it's not true to say that something can't exist because you can't see it, because there are quite a lot of things which we believe in in physics, even though we can't see them. But it, it is certainly a, a, a philosophical issue as to whether we regard the multiverse as proper physics or, or philosophy. But it, it is, a, for me, in fact, the evidence for the multiverse is these fine tunings. Because I, I'm, I've written a book about the multiverse, universe or multiverse, so I'm a fan of the multiverse. That doesn't mean I did, don't believe in God, because actually I don't see why God can't exist as well as the universe. If, God, if you believe in God, if he can create one universe, he can create a multiverse as well. But the, the strange thing is I can write about the multiverse and publish articles about it in the journals of physics, and I can publish a book about it, and now it's relatively respectable. I mean, it was a taboo idea when we first wrote about it in 1979, but now it's relatively respectable. A lot of very famous physicists like the idea of the multiverse. People like uh, Stephen Hawking and Stephen Weinberg and, and mm -hmm. Lenny Susskind and, and uh, many famous physicists are very happy with the multiverse now. But, but the irony is that I regard the multiverse as just as speculative as anything I've said about models of psi and higher dimensions, but for sociological reasons. And in fact, the things I work on in physics, like black holes and time machines and the many worlds and quantum theory are equally exotic and equally speculative. But somehow I'm allowed to work on those things without getting into trouble. If I start talking about higher dimensional mind, I'll get into trouble. I can talk to you, but if I start talking to my physics friends, so it's an interesting sociological phenomenon. Uh, you know, the argument of uh, Stephen Hawking in his last book against God was that time begot, began with the Big Bang. And so the God didn't have time to create anything. So the, therefore, there is no God, right? But then there is this argument, so at the same time, this string theory says that there is an infinite number of universes where Big Bangs happen all the time. So then there must be something before Big Bangs. Yeah. So well, is let, there something hmm. before Big Bang? Let me just say, first of all, that string theory has this concept of a string landscape, which have different values of what's called the cosmological constant. So that's a particular realization of the multiverse, which I was just talking about. So string theory provides one particular version of the multiverse. There are actually many different versions. But another version of the multiverse is that, um, well, there's, a, there's one example of the multiverse is you have a cyclic model where the universe expands and recollapses. And then the idea is that every time it, it it collapses to a crunch, big crunch, the constants of nature get changed. So the idea is that every cycle the constants are different and then most cycles the constants don't allow the existence of observers, so they're stillborn if you like, but every now and then the constants are right so that you can produce, the universe lights up and becomes aware of it like a light bulb. So that's a, that's a multiverse in time Okay. There's also a multiverse in space. You have what's called the inflationary model of the early universe, which says the universe expanded very fast. And in that case, you have our whole visible universe is, is basically in a bubble. But there are lots of different bubbles. Okay. And so each bubble is, is, is one of the elements of the multiverse. But that's a multiverse in some sense spread out in space. The string landscape says you've got uh, different universes which are, um, uh, have different values of the cosmological constant. So that's another version of the multiverse. 
And there's another version too, which corresponds to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, but that's another issue. So there are many different types of multiverse. And, but I mention that because one of the multiverse versions is the one where you have a universe which is cyclic, expands and recontracts, expands and recontracts. Now, let's now go back to the question you originally asked about whether time begins with the Big Bang. Hawking and Penrose discovered the singularity theorems, which says that basically the universe begun with a singularity. If you go back in time, there must have been a singularity, which is basically a point where physics breaks down. Relativity theory breaks down. And that's because densities become infinite and things like that. And it was a remarkable discovery, this goes back to the 1960s, that Einstein's theory predicts its own downfall. And, and that was really important. You also have singularities in, in black holes, but that's a separate type of singularity. Now, people used to say, well, we just don't know what happens at the singularity because all known physics breaks down. And you could just say, therefore, that's beyond physics. So actually, when it was first suggested the universe began with the Big Bang, this was taken as evidence for God because it was argued that this is like Genesis. And the Pope even said that this means you know, we can take, we can go back closer and closer to the Big Bang, but we can't explain the Big Bang itself. You need someone to light the fuse. And so that was originally interpreted as evidence for God. But physicists didn't like that, but this is what the Pope said. But then that means that God, or whatever force there is, operates outside of any laws of physics, outside yes, of space, outside of time, outside of anything that's true. at all. <laughs> exactly, because the, the idea would be physics breaks down, um, but, there's but no therefore time, there's no God space who breaks the, who lights the fuse has to be outside physics. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That would be the implication. Now, then Stephen Hawking comes along, and having proved the existence of a singularity, he then, 20 years later, returned to the question of what happens at a singularity. Instead of saying we don't know physics breaks down, let's try and understand what happens. And that's what's called the domain of quantum cosmology. And Stephen and his group were able to actually formulate a theory of physics which was able to describe what happens at the Big Bang. And that's more complicated because it involves quantum cosmology, so relativity theory and quantum theory, merging them together. But one of the features of his particular theory, which he, he worked on with Jim Hartle and other physicists, was that when you go back to the beginning of time, begin to the beginning of the universe, time, in a technical sense, uh, becomes space-like. So, t because the distinction between time and space in relativity theory, but in some sense, when you get back to the Big Bang, time becomes space-like. And this means that there is nothing before the Big Bang. It's rather like saying, what is north of the North Pole? When you get to the North Pole, you've gone as far as you can go. And so this is saying basically that time itself begins at the Big Bang. And so Hawking and Hartle say the universe, time and space are born with the Big Bang. That's what happens at the singularity. And that, but now he's got a description within physics itself because quantum cosmology is part of physics. So then he says, I don't need God. The universe explains itself. And he wrote a book called The Universe in a Nutshell, which basically had the view that um, everything, the universe explains itself. You don't need God. So then he went back, he went back to the Vatican and he spoke to another pope and he gave a talk which is more or less saying we don't need God, although I don't think the Pope probably heard it that way. But then you've got to realize that actually not, Hawking may be wrong. I mean, we don't really understand what happens at quantum cosmology. He was arguing that time begins at the Big Bang. Other people think that the universe actually, there was a big crunch, that it, before the expansion phase, there was a contraction phase. This is the cyclic model, which I referred to before when I was talking about the multiverse. So 
it's not clear that time begins at the Big Bang. Some people think that time existed before the Big Bang, but you were just in a collapsing universe. So the answer is we just don't know. I mean, a singularity basically means you don't know for sure, but even though we're trying to answer it. So some people quite like the idea of a cyclic universe. Now, the point about a cyclic universe is it sort of may cycle go on forever. So you postpone the question of how was the universe created? Because if the cycles go on indefinitely in the past, you never have to ask where did the universe come from because it just carries on forever. Uh, it, it was always there. If you, you'd only, you only have a problem creating the universe if it began at this finite time. I, I can't imagine forever. It's no, just, and nor I, can I. I, I, I there, there must be a genesis, there must be a starting point somewhere, right? I personally, Even in the cycles. Exactly, but, but you're now appealing to a sort of intuitive argument. I personally don't like infinities either. I don't believe in, I don't like the idea of a universe that, that goes on forever and, and has existed forever. Infinity is a feature of mathematics. I suspect it never really arises in physics. When you get infinities in physics, it's only because the physics has broken down. You get an infinite density as a singularity because the physics has broken down. In reality, the, the extended physics is going to get rid of that infinite density. So I don't like, I, I'm quite happy with the psychic universe, but I prefer a psychic universe which still has a beginning. And uh, it's rather like we don't know whether the universe is going to expand forever or recollapse. It looks at the moment as though it's going to expand forever, but I don't like the idea of going on forever. I, I like to think the universe will re, will recollapse. So my own view is I like the psychic universe, but which still has a start. After all, most cycles do have a start uh, and maybe an end. So what I'm saying is uh, the, the whole history of whether you need God is, is very interesting. Uh, at first, the Big Bang seemed to support God. Then the Big Bang... And the multiverse seemed to do away with God. And remember, we have, if you've got a multiverse, it's not just one Big Bang anyway. I, I actually, but in my own model, remember, I, I think of these higher dimensions which represent mind. In my own model, these higher dimensions we don't normally see, but when you go back to the beginning of the universe, these higher dimensions become manifest. And so when you go back to the beginning of the universe, the universe is higher dimensional. Well, in my picture, those higher dimensions are mind. So what you're really saying is the universe comes from mind. Again, that's not something the physicists will like, but if you start accepting that the higher dimensions are associated with mind, you are saying that what came before the universe, mind. And if you want to, if you want to, in some sense, go even further, you might say, well, if spirit precedes mind, you could say even spirit as well. So obviously you're getting to a very dangerous theological domain now where it is like saying <laughs> God created the universe. However, it all depends what you mean by God because the word God is very vague. I, I've talked about this universal consciousness, consciousness of the big C, and obviously you might want to identify that with God in some sense. Um, some philosophers, how, sorry, some philosophers were saying that this was a necessary existence of itself and in itself that does not need any explanation. This is what most scientists, would, most physicists, would, Hawking would like to say that, that you don't ever need to invoke. No, but there is God. So yeah. they say there is God, but it's a necessary, the one, oh, oh, a necessary okay. Those existence. Those are the people who believe in. Yes. In God. yes. yes. Uh, of course, you can from, you can tackle that question yes. from a philosophical perspective, yeah. and then that's a. I'm, I'm not a philosopher, so in some sense, I, yeah. I can't get involved in that discussion. But just from a physical perspective, I would I would say that if if you think of my model of mind as a physical model, it's saying. If you think of this universal mind in some sense as being God or part of God, you're, you're putting God into the picture as well. But it all depends what you mean by God. Exactly. Well, we're using so many terms and, and often we talk about consciousness, we talk about mind, we talk about spirit. Maybe you start with consciousness. What is consciousness to you? Well, you know, that is a very complicated question because you can ask a hundred people what consciousness is and you'll get a hundred and one replies. That's why I said to you. <laughs> I mean, the word consciousness is used in so many different ways. All these words, yeah. mind, spirit, soul, God, they're all it's used in so many yes. different ways. And a lot of the disagreements arise because of the fact they're being used in different ways. 
you also have to distinguish between contents of consciousness and consciousness itself. Normally, when I'm talking about my higher dimensional space, to ex which accommodates mental experiences, I'm talking about the contents of consciousness. Now, that's different from the consciousness itself, the first person awareness itself. The, the, the con because that is what's related. Whatever consciousness is, it involves a sense of self and it involves the passage of time. But then the question is, what do you mean by the sense of self? Because I said there's a hierarchy of levels of consciousness. And that corresponds to a hierarchy of levels of self. So at this level, you and I, Natalia and Bernard, are, diff are different beings in this space. But at a higher level of consciousness, you and I, and maybe everybody else, they're part, part of a single self, sort of bigger self. And maybe when you get to the highest level of all, there's only one self, a big S, which you might want to identify with, with God. And all of these are different levels of consciousness. So when you say, what is consciousness? My answer is inevitably going to depend upon my particular theory of what consciousness is. And someone with a different theory of consciousness will give you a different answer. But within my own theory, I can answer what consciousness is to some extent, and it has this hierarchical structure. But another person who didn't believe my theory might well have a different, a different theory. This is true in general in, 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 in physics. Your answer to the question depends on your theory. <laughs> That's true of anything. <laughs> You know, it's like asking a physicist, what is energy? Or what is... The answer will depend on his own theory of what energy is. You know, it's like one of the questions I asked. <laughs> when I went to school and I had physics classes, it was all clear, we had laws of nature, <laughs> it was all solid, you know. You just follow the, you know, the equations and you will arrive at the same results. Now I'm listening to all kinds of scientists and uh, looking at the quantum physics, then they say, no, no, there are no law na laws of nature, there are tendencies and trends. <laughs> Is that true? Do we have laws well, of nature or we don't? Or we have both? That's a very interesting question, because the point is that the laws of nature only apply in certain domains. The way in which we discovered the laws of nature within physics is by in some sense, only observing a certain part of the universe. You consider this universe in isolation, this part of the universe in isolation, and you don't have to worry about other sort of complications. Then you come to understand for this system how, what the laws of nature are. Now what, and so for example, Newton discovers his laws of, of, of mechanics and the law of gravitation, and that is observed to work very well when studying the solar system and, and things like that. But then what you find is that as you go on, you find that your, as, as physics progresses, you find that your laws weren't completely comprehensive. They only applied in a certain context. If you are, have a bigger context, other factors come in and they require a slightly more complicated picture. So Newton knew about gravity, then you had to accommodate electromagnetism when we discovered the forces of electricity and magnetism. Every time you you look at a new phenomena or expand the context, you find you have to change the laws somewhat. So, for example, Newton's laws prevail for 300 years. Einstein comes along and says, no, we have relativity theory, which applies at high speed, and then you have to have a, a different set of laws. But this different set of laws contain the first set of laws. So it's not as though the first laws were wrong. They were right in their, in their context. It's just that you have to broaden the context. And then general relativity came along and showed that special relativity was only a, an approximation. So physics progresses by changing the paradigm progressively. And every time you, you have a new paradigm, you show that the previous laws were, were actually just weren't the full story. They applied only in a special context. Now, the most dramatic illustration of that came with quantum theory. We discovered at the beginning of the 20th century quantum mechanics, which is the description of the microdomain. And that's completely different from the classical picture. Particles aren't like billiard balls as they were in Newton's model. 
that they are they, they described by a wave, a quantum wave, and, and that collapses when you make an observation. Uh, and so that lo- it then becomes localized or attained a certain state. But uh, and there are many other anomalies associated with quantum theory. You have the so-called entanglement. Objects can be separated by a large distance, but still connected, even though that seems to be inconsistent with the laws of relativity and, and things. Well, I won't go into the complications of quantum theory because it, it, it's a complicated issue. But the point is, quantum theory and relativity theory are completely inconsistent. They're incompatible. Quantum theory works on the microscopic level, in the microscopic domain, with amazing precision. You know, you can test it to 12 places of decimals and it works. Relativity works in the macroscopic domain to incredible precision, to 12 places of decimals. We detect gravitational waves and things. And a wonderful proof of relativity. However, the remarkable thing is these two theories are not compatible. So one, it works in that context, the micro context, that works in the macro context. That's why we're looking for the final theory, which I referred to earlier on in the conversation, which marries these two theories together. That's the theory, I hope, which is going to accommodate consciousness in some sense. But the but theory... is it possible? Hmm? Is it possible at all? Some I hope people so. say it's not possible. Well, I mean, the point is, I, there has to be a final theory. <laughs> I mean, we don't agree. No one has found the theory yet. It might take a thousand years. There has to be a final theory, I mean, which, which is going to reconcile these two theories. Whether it's going to take consciousness, I don't know. But I, it's only, to me, a question of when we find them mm. with this theory and whether this theory is going to... T- consciousness. There must be such a theory because I'm the physical world, physics works so beautifully. It provides such a comprehensive, unified explanation of the world. There has to be a final, well it may not be a final theory in the sense that it, 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 it may just be, you see what particle physicists call a theory of everything is just a theory of particles. It's a very pretentious phrase, a theory of everything. Mm. And the normal theory of everything, as the part of physicists use it, doesn't make any reference to consciousness at all. When people talk about the triumph of physics, they're not actually talking about consciousness and mind at all. That's why I, I don't. That's why I think physics has to be expanded to accommodate my experience of the world. But some physicists will think of theory of fi- everything as just being a theory of elementary particles. What I'm saying is, no, the theory of everything has to include consciousness. But we don't for sure know who's right. It may be the first set of physicists correct, even though they're rather ambitious, but I hope hope they're wrong. But the point I'm making is that paradigms, physical paradigms, are really just mental models. The, The theory of physics now, the picture of the world from physics, has no connection with our common sense view of reality. Okay, the common sense view of reality is the classical Newtonian picture of three dimensions with clocks. That's wrong, but that's common sense reality. So what physics has done, it's gone through a series of paradigm shifts involving, for example, well, the split between classical and relativity, but also involving higher dimensions from three to four to five dimensions, kaluza klein theory, all the way to 11 dimensions in, in M-theory. And so, in a certain sense, when you, when you refer to the fact that the laws of physics are always changing, that's correct. But it doesn't mean all the previous effort was wasted. There's steps on the way. They're just, it's a progression of mental models. And I always say, what's interesting in physics is not whether your theory is ultimately right. All, most things are wrong in the end, but whether it's useful, whether it's a step on the way. And so I argue that there will be a theory, of, I, I don't really like calling it a theory of everything because we don't know it's everything, what is everything. But I think there will be a theory which merges relatively in quantum theory and have, has consciousness. But that in itself may not be the final theory, you know. There may be a, a theory which goes beyond space and time altogether. Who can tell? Uh, maybe the journey never ends. So maybe the, or I'm saying, instead of saying it's a theory of everything, it's certainly a theory of much, it's theory of more we've got at the moment, put it that way. It's a, it's a theory of more than just matter. It's a post-materialist science. 
I was wondering how can we incorporate consciousness into a theory or a way of doing science because consciousness by definition means a first person perspective and today the scientific method is objective so it means it's a third person perspective almost always so the moment we do incorporate it would it not become a, a, a just a subjective uh, exchange of ideas I would say well, How do you see that? It is true that conventional, Would we not lose science? conventional physics, maybe conventional science, but let's just talk about physics. Yeah. Conventional physics does have a third-person description of the world. Even though it involves observations which are made by individuals, the physics itself is describing the third-person perspective. So when you say you want to expand physics to incorporate the first-person perspective, well, when you say you want to take the first-person perspective, you might argue by definition that's beyond physics. But that depends on your concept of physics, because the distinction between third-person and third-person and first-person is that third-person is associated with an objective reality, and first-person is thought to be associated with a, a subjective experience in your head, as we said before. But what if that subjective reality is itself part of a higher... Well, what if that subjective experience is itself part of a, of, a, of a reality which goes beyond the normal material reality? Then the distinction between first person and third person no longer... You can no longer exclude first person hood. It's rather like I, I mentioned that time, the passage of time goes beyond... People say, philosophers say, the passage of time is a feature of mind and not a feature of the physical world. But if you have a theory of physics which includes mind, then it also includes the passage of time. So your expansion of physics is, is actually is going to accommodate certain features of first personhood. Because the mental it's, it's a, so the assumption that third person is real and first person is imaginary, that's what I'm disagreeing about. I'm saying even your first person experience, even your mental experience, is also part of a higher, higher dimensional reality. So I'm, I'm extending the concept of reality. That still doesn't answer all the questions because it's, there's a very profound question which I often ask, which is why am I Bernard and why are you Natalia? Even if you believe there's only one mind and that ultimately we're one eye, but if this one eye, this one mind is fragmented into billions of little minds, you've still got to ask the question, why am I Bernard and, and why are you Natalia? And, and that's a really difficult question. You see, I always give this example. Imagine you and I are born at the same time, I mean, you're younger than me, but let's imagine we're born at the same time in, in the same maternity ward. Your brain lights up and my brain lights up at exactly the same time, okay? So the question is, why am I in my brain and you're in your brain? Now, a materialist who believes that the brain generates consciousness would say that's not even a meaningful question because it presupposes there is something outside the brain which somehow gets anchored in a brain. But that's meaningless. From a, if you believe the brain generates consciousness, that's meaningless. And yet how can it be meaningless? Because I am me and I'm not you. So to me, the very fact of my being me disproves the view that the brain generates consciousness. Because if the question is meaningless within that standard paradigm, that paradigm must be wrong, in my view. So I, th I, I th so that to me, but you see first, it's the first personhood which raises this issue. Because I am me as first person, you and Tatalia as first person. So, and then the question is, how do you explain first personhood? And in my theory, it's all to do with the nature of time. I, I, as you know, I've argued that you need a, a higher dimensional view of time in order to explain first personhood. But first personhood is, is complicated because there's a hierarchy of first persons. So I, but the point is, 
I am using an extension of physics which does now relate to first personhood. Whether you want to call it physics is another matter because you, 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 different people will define physics in different ways. Uh, it's not normal physics. I'm talking about this higher dimensional physics as opposed to the physics on the brain. But it's physicists themselves who are invoking these higher dimensions. And, and whether you, uh, but even and physicists some disagree. I mean, some physicists think that M theory is mathematics rather than physics because it doesn't relate to the physical world. But, but then nothing in physics now really relates to common sense, the common sense physical world. So I, I take the view that the new physics will actually accommodate first personhood. But in all these statements, I'm, I'm, I'm deviating from the mainstream view. That's in your view a direction forward, if we are to expand and create such a theory that would reconcile all these elements and include everything that we exclude today from scientific method. Yeah, I mean, the question is, how do you test these sorts well, of exactly. theories? <laughs> I mean, if you say, what's the evidence for extra dimensions? Yeah. There could conceivably be evidence from physics, because physicists are looking for these extra dimensions. They looked at them in the high, Large Hadron Collider. They haven't found them. That doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means that the, there is a different scale. That we haven't reached the energies required to see the higher dimensions. Now, it's conceivable you'll never have the energy to see these extra dimensions. That will be rather frustrating. So the people who criticise M-theory, because there's no evidence for it, well, they may be so right in a thousand years. That would be rather sad. Um, I like to think there will eventually be evidence, but until then I would claim that the evidence for the extra dimensions actually comes from experience. I would say people experience extra dimensions in the first person, even if they haven't yet demonstrated their existence in the third person. But it's an intriguing thought that if ever they do discover extra dimensions in the Large Hadron Collider, in some weird way, this is probing mind. <laughs> Sounds crazy. But that's some of the implications, this idea. What do you expect will be the biggest breakthroughs in physics and um, astronomy in the coming years? Do we already know what we don't know? Well, I mean, you're now asking me a question in my conventional in cosmological general. capacity, where I can, I can say things... As a scientist, things, I can speak with broad getting, interests. Yeah, but I can also get in, I can talk about that when they get into trouble. Undoubtedly, as an astronomer, I know what the key problems are. The key problems are, what is the dark matter? What is the dark energy which is causing the universe to accelerate? Because most of the universe, 70% of the universe is in dark energy, 25% of the universe is in dark matter, and 5% of the universe is in dark matter, is visible matter like you and me. So it's a, a very frustrating that most of the universe, we just don't know what it is. But nevertheless, cosmologists are working on this and trying to find out you know, what it is. And I, I, I think we will know eventually. We'll know eventually what the dark matter and what the dark energy is. We don't know for sure what it is. I have my own theories, but that goes beyond the current conversation. So undoubtedly, that will be a, an important breakthrough. And uh, astronomy is always making developments. You know, the detection of gravitational waves is giving us all sorts of insights into those sorts of questions. I think what happens at the Big Bang, I think we're going to get more ed evidence about that. We're going to know whether there was a previous cycle. I think observational evidence will come to bear on that. This is when cosmology within particle physics, we're going to, I think, to find out whether you've got supersymmetry. You know, the most recent development was the discussion of uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson, the so-called Higgs God particle, which sort of verified the standard model of particle physics. But we know the standard model of particle physics isn't complete either. And that's why you, you invoke other ideas, such as what's called supersymmetry. Uh, and that's part of the way to M theory, that the, the, the final theory may be. But, so I think within particle physics, but there may be exciting developments verifying supersymmetry or finding the particles which make up the dark matter, if that's what the dark matter is. Supersymmetry, just for people to... Oh, <laughs> supersymmetry. You've got two types of particles in nature. You've got the bose, you've got the fermions, which are the actual particles like protons and electrons and neutrons, which make up 
you know, the solid matter. But then there are the bosons, which are particles associated with the forces between those particles. So, for example, electromagnetism is reflects the, the photons. The strong force is transmitted by gluons. And the gravitational force is transmitted by gravitons. So all of these particles, they are called bosons. And technically, they have a spin. And this graviton is spin too. The boson is, uh, the gluon is, uh, well, the graviton is spin, spin two. The, the photon is spin one. And, and, and the, but that's getting too technical. So those are the bosons on the fermions. So the fermions are the, the, the particles you're made of. The, the bosons are the particles that transmit the forces between them. They're separate because they have different spins. The, the, the fermions have got spin half, okay, whereas the bosons have got spin, integer spin. But there is a version of particle physics which amalgamates the bosons and the fermions, and that's called supersymmetry. Well, that's a theory, but it still hasn't been experimentally verified yet. Because if it's true, there are all sorts of other particles which haven't yet been found. But that's getting a little bit technical. So that's developments in, in uh, particle physics. I, for me, the key thing is going to be experiments in which find the higher dimensions, because for me at least, these higher dimensions are really important. And if you could get experimental evidence for that, I think that would be a gain, a, a huge paradigm shift. If they do find the extra dimensions, I, of course, will jump in and say, ah, oh, they're the extra dimensions I need. If they don't find the extra dimensions, I, I can't do that. So obviously I hope they find the extra dimensions. But the point about physics is you often can't anticipate what the, the next breakthroughs are going to be. I'm just telling you what at the moment we, we, we are anticipating. Yeah, yeah, but I was thinking about like gravity, you know, even, uh, you know, Aristotle was still observing uh, some correlations uh, between, you know, objects and where at the time when gravity was, wasn't even named or formulated in any way, right? Then, then, then Newton came, formulated yeah. it as a force, mm. then Einstein came, formulated it as a field. But at, even at the time of Aristotle, they were already describing some things happening. Yeah, so yeah. they already knew that you know, something exists, they couldn't name it yet. Yeah, so that's absolutely. what I was saying. And, and that's true of phenomena in general. You, you first observe them and, and you mm. might just be wondering about it for a few hundred years and you get a, a theory of them. And, and then that theory will not, not be correct. In a few hundred years later, you get another theory. So, but the phenomena, it's rather like when we talk about psychic experiences. You know, people have been having psychic experiences for thousands of years. You can go back to the ancient Greeks and they all talk about near-death experiences and telepathy and things like that. So the idea is very old and it's just the way in which you're able to investigate the idea and then begin to theorize about the idea. That's what's, that's what's developing. Yeah. So having worked in academia and on parapsychological phenomena, what recommendations or advice could you give to your young colleagues how to approach and how to do science going forward? Well, this is interesting. It's a sociological question. When I was graduating, I had to decide whether to do a PhD in parapsychology or, or cosmology. At that time, there were no jobs in parapsychology. And, uh, and therefore, I, I, I went, and I was fascinated in cosmology as well, so it's not as though it was second best, but, but so there was no question I would do cosmology. And I was advised, I was told, establish your reputation first in the conventional field, and then when you start talking about parapsychology, people might listen to you. I mean, you see, as a, people might think my ideas about mind are crazy, but they, they will listen to me when I talk about cosmology. So they might say, oh, well, he might not be completely crazy because he's written a good paper about black holes or something like that. So th th that's advice I was given. Establish yourself in a respectable area of science, and then you can later on talk about these other things. Well, now I'm retired, you see, so I can now talk about these other things without losing my job. But the situation has changed a bit. I mean, in a way, that's a rather sad state of affairs because you would like people to be able to work on these things now because people are com constantly saying, I'm fascinated in these ideas, matter, mind, spirit. I want to do a PhD in them. Where do I go? 
the situation is better now. I, I, I referred earlier in our conversation to the fact that there have been 100 PhDs in parapsychology, but that's in psychology departments, not in physics departments. I would look forward to a time in that when you've got the post-materialist paradigm, when actually people can do a PhD and publish papers in mainstream journals on these topics. The problem, even at the moment, I can't recommend someone to do a PhD in this subject if they really want to pursue a conventional academic career, because they're not, it will be hard to get a job as a postdoc and then as a professor if they've been working on a conventional, uh, controversial area. But the thing is, and it'll be hard to get funds for it as well. But the thing is that what is conventional changes with time. So over the passage of 100 years, the situation changes. Consciousness was a taboo word only 30 years ago. Physicists would never talk about it. Now they can talk about it. So a they can do a PhD in neuroscience and even the physics of consciousness. Um, the anthropic, I've talked about the fine tuning, that was a taboo word um, certainly 45 years ago. Now people talk about it because the multiverse is in some sense respectable. So you can now start talking about the anthropic. We never call it the anthropic, we used to call it the A word. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's becoming respectable. So there's a C word, which is becoming respectable. There's the A word, which is becoming respectable. You still really can't talk about the P word, which is parapsychology, or the G word, which is God, or even the S word, which is spiritual, in certain quarters. I mean, I'm talking among, um, about physics. Physicists. So, but it's a gradual. So the situation in another 20 years may be different. And I hope there will be this new paradigm. And then when the paradigm has come, that will mean you can do your PhD and get a professorship in, in studying this ex extended physics. But that's not still not the case at the moment. But you can, but the situation is improving. So you can still do a PhD on, well, neuroscience and quantum theory and, and things like that. So I would still say to somebody, and I do say this because people do approach me, I say, look, only do this if you're really passionate about it. You should only ever do a PhD if you're really passionate about it, but I, I can't promise you'll get a job at the end of it. And so if, if you're thinking about your long-term academic career, um, even now you should, probably shouldn't be working in this area because there's still a great bias against it. For me, a completely un unjustified bias, but there is a bias there. And I, I don't mind. I know most of my physics colleagues won't take seriously some of the things I've talked about this afternoon, but it doesn't bother me at all because I don't, I don't feel any great need to convert them. They're doing their thing. Stephen Hawking was my friend and supervisor. He wouldn't have accepted any of this. He didn't believe in psi. He didn't believe in God or anything like that. And that was fine, I, because uh, we disagreed, but we, uh, Steve was a great physicist and he was a genius at what he did. I didn't want him to get, put his mind into all in these other directions. So I'm quite happy for physicists to be doing what they're doing, because science is all very narrow now. You can only, whatever your area of science, you can only focus on a very narrow area and you can't be aware of all the other things. So um, I, I, it's, I don't have any great, um, that doesn't bother me, but it does mean that I wouldn't have been able to get a career if earlier on in my career. If I'd done my, if I was writing my PhD on this topic, I would never have got a postdoc position. I would never have become a professor. So even though I don't, I don't mind if people don't take me seriously, it, it does upset me the fact that I couldn't have had an academic career if I'd been writing papers on it and so that's still true I think today. So sort of follow your heart but keep in mind uh, your career choices as well still. Yeah because I, that... after all I've always worked on my ideas but I've done them in my spare time because you know we don't we only work eight hours a day whatever it is we work mm. now for, to get our salary so it's not our whole life is given up to your professional career and now I'm retired of course I have even more time 
for yeah, you. but in any case, yeah. I think we would expect from science to be maybe a little bit more open-minded than, than I hope mainstream so. science I, currently I, and is. And I right? think that when the... Because it is becoming more open-minded. I mean, the history of science is a, the history of science becoming more open-minded. Mm. And expanding the domains of science to areas which were originally thought to be beyond science. So the situation is improving, but it's improving on a, quite a long time scale, 100 years. <laughs> so that's sort of... We, we should change our species present. <laughs> exactly, exactly. With a bigger species present, that would help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bernard, thank you very much for this rich and very interesting Thank you, Natalia. You asked many interesting questions. And I would, I would like to ask you more questions, but maybe next time. Over a cup of tea. Yeah, over a cup of tea. And let's hope the tea freezes. Yeah, and we're in the same <laughs> species <laughs> present. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We hope that you enjoy this conversation. I've had quite a few wow moments <laughs> and I wish the same for you.